Hello, everyone. So happy that you were able to join us today. I'm Lisa Commendatory. I'm the Director of Student Orientation Family Programs, and it's truly an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce Mr. Dennis Lehane as our Meet the Author feature speaker. Mr. Lehane was born and raised in Dorchester, Massachusetts, right down the road from us. Since his first novel, A Drink Before the War, won the Seamus Award, he has published 12 more novels that have been translated into 30 different languages and have become international bestsellers. Darkness, Take My Hand, Sacred, Gone Baby Gone, Prayers for Rain, Mystic River, Shutter Island, The Given Day, Moonlight Mile, Live by Night, and World Gone By. Four of his novels, Live by Night, Mystic River, Gone, by, Gone Baby Gone, and Shutter Island have been adapted into award-winning films. His most recent work is a standalone novel, Since We Fell. His novel, The Drop, was inspired by his earlier short story entitled Animal Rescue. The Drop was also released as a movie featuring James Gandolfini in his last acting role. Mr. Lehane also served as a staff writer on the acclaimed HBO series, The Wire, and a writer-producer on the fourth season of HBO's Boardwalk Empire. He's currently a writer and producer on the television adapt adaptation of Stephen King's Mr. Mercedes and has two dramatic series in the development for DirecTV. Please give a very warm welcome to an award-winning novelist and screenwriter, Mr. Dennis Lehane. Hi, how you doing? Everybody okay? So, as, am I to understand you, you're all new parents at Northeastern, with new students at Northeastern, is that true? Yeah. Wow, well, well welcome. Uh, my dad wanted me to go to the school, but I let him down. Uh, he wanted me to go to the school, he worked right around the corner, so this was, I think he thought we'd commute in together. He'd save on gas, you know. Um, well look, uh, how many of you are from Boston? Okay, that's, that's a decent number. Well done, well done. The rest of you, welcome to Boston. We're all a little nuts. Um, take that into consideration. Let me just get one thing out of the way why I'm wearing a suit. I'm in town to attend a wedding, so I backed the two together, and this is paying for the wedding, so, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm often... Uh, asked to do things associated with Boston, I think, um, once everybody discovers the Wahlbergs are busy. Um, so they brought me in. I am associated a lot with uh, Boston um, to the point where I really do believe that if a movie happens and there's a, a gun in it and a bar, everybody thinks I wrote it. Um, I have had people thank me for um, uh, writing Mystic Pizza. Um, it's true, which would make me a prodigy. I would have been 19. Um, but the big one is The Departed. I get fan letters for The Departed. I have nothing to do with The Departed. The closest I came to The Departed is exactly as close as you did. I literally paid my 10 bucks and I saw it at the Fenway Landmark. Um, but I, I have had people uh, thank me for writing that. Um, I've literally seen arguments break out over it. Um, people didn't know I was there. And I've heard people say, no, he wrote The Departed. And, no, he didn't. He wrote Mystic River. No, he wrote The Departed. I'm telling you. Watch it, kid. So um, I received a really lovely fan, piece of fan mail from a, from a famous person thanking me for The Departed. Um, the Departed was, by the way, written by a guy named Bill Monahan, who's from Dorchester. And sometimes I, I, I imagine he's walking around his palatial estate in Hollywood, and he's going, I wrote that. Um, <laughs> So, yes, so um, the Bostonians being a little um, nuts, I can say that because I'm from here. Um, one of the reasons I think I became a writer is because of um, uh, Bostonians um, coming, coming from here and trying to capture 
the voice of Boston, um, which is very distinct. I do want to say I've traveled all over the world and definitely all over this country. And Boston, for better or worse, is in a particularly distinct place. Um, there are very few places, there are no places in the country quite like it. Um, and I think it's because of attitude. I think it's just a little bit, we're all just kind of like a can short of a six pack. Um, 49 cards in the deck kind of vibe. Um, and I wanted to capture that voice because I grew up hearing it and people in Boston speak um, with italics in a way that nobody else does. Uh, they know how to hit a different word in a sentence to make it funnier. Um, I will say that I've never met anybody funnier than half of the people I grew up with, including most comedians. And it, I don't think it's a mistake that almost every comedian that you can find now comes from Boston. Um, so um, I grew up in Dorchester, um, and it, it was um, the neighborhood that um, is the neighborhood of my first five books. Um, it's, an, it's a city, uh, it's a neighborhood and a city that I love very much, and I think one of the reasons I do um, is because it was, um, Boston was a particularly um, beloved city to my father, who was an immigrant, um, and he wrapped his arms around the city in a very different way, and he took, he never used the expressway, he hated the expressway. So we would just drive the surface streets, and I would learn all the neighborhoods through that. Um, so I'll tell you something interesting about my, my dad, and there's going to be a lot of things about my father I'm going to talk about today because ultimately you're all parents, you have kids in college. My father was a seventh, had a seventh grade education, really wanted his kid to go to college. Um, there was four ahead of me, and they all tanked and left me holding the bag. So I had to be the kid who went to college, so all the responsibility of the entire family and my father's hopes and dreams rested on my shoulders, no pressure. Um, but my dad uh, did have a seventh grade education and, um, and we were not a literary family. So people are always fascinated by how it was that I became a writer if I didn't grow up with books in the house. I mean, we really didn't. We had a set of encyclopedias um, that were clearly from a day my father didn't see the salesman coming and, and he bought them. So, but here's the reason, I think. Just because we didn't come from a literary family didn't mean I didn't come from a storytelling family. And my father, so we'll start with the first legend that's true, that matters in his story, which is my father was the 16th of 18 people, of 18 kids. So his family was, there was 18 people in his family. This family was so vast that the oldest son and the youngest son never met. And they lived full lives. And they moved to different, one of them moved to America and stayed there, and the other one was born. And then years later, Many years later, the youngest one became a publican. He owned a couple of bars. And uh, he charged members of the family um, for a drink. <laughs> Which like, seems like a really crappy thing, but if you knew how much my dad and his sisters could drink, um, <laughs> it might have been an act of economic preservation. But the oldest brother heard about that, and he was like, the hell with it. I never want to meet the, meet the guy. Uh, if he's going to charge me for a drink, I don't want to meet the little boom. So we didn't meet him, so we never met him. So my parents came over here like all immigrants and they started a kind of a daisy chain. And so I didn't grow up in 1980s Boston. I grew up in 1940s Ireland um, because everybody I knew until the age of six spoke with a brogue. And what happened was the brothers and the brothers-in-law and the sisters and the sisters-in-law and they all moved to Dorchester, a couple of outliers went out to Somerville and we thought that was a little weird, but. Everybody else lived in Dorchester, lived in Mattapan, and they would get together every weekend. Every weekend they would get together. And they would sit and they would tell stories. And that's what they would do. They would sit in the living room, and then you would know that they would, had pretty much hit their alcohol limit when they started singing Danny Boy. That was usually the, the time to shut it all down. So they would get together and they would sit around and they would tell stories. And me and my brother began to notice something. That every, I don't know, eight or nine weeks, sometimes three months, the same story would come back into rotation. But it would be different. <laughs> they would have tweaked it. They were lying, <laughs> essentially. And so what I understood at a very early age was that my family had an interesting relationship with facts. 
And that's kind of how they were treated. Facts. And nobody would ever say, like, oh, no, Tommy, you told that story three months ago, and it was a horse and not a bicycle. They'd all nod. They'd all be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, they were there, and they remembered it. Me and my brother were looking at each other like, what the hell is going on here? And he'd be like, oh, yes, that was a nice horse. Sure was. I remember feeding him an apple myself. And then he'd be like, oh, yeah, that was a good apple. And then they go on about that. It took us years. It took me years when I was in graduate school to understand. I went to graduate school, and I finally discovered in graduate school, my professor called writing the lie that tells the truth. And I th that's what fiction writing is. It's the lie that tells the truth. And I thought, oh, now it all makes sense. Because what they were trying to do, all immigrants live with a central shame and guilt. And that is that they left the place they love. They left their homeland. And they can never quite get over it. And they spend the rest of their lives trying to make sense of it. They, they, and they will always talk about the old country. The old country, they would never talk. My, my parents, I don't think, would ever talk about anything current except politics. Everything was how crazy this country was, politics, and then how great the old country was. It was always how great the old country, how wonderful it was. They wouldn't do that back in Ireland. Never do that back in Ireland. Nobody got divorced back in Ireland. Never happened. Nobody had children out of wedlock back in Ireland. Never happened. We go back to Ireland, there's like five cousins born out of wedlock. There's like 15 divorces, you know, and everybody's like, ah, we don't, know what to, we don't know what those other ones are talking about. But they stayed fixed in time because the world that they left was something they could never quite reconcile with. They had to leave it because they, they couldn't eat otherwise. They had to come to America. They had to make a better lives for their children. But they could never get over the fact that they'd left it. And so that was why they told the same stories over and over and over again to make sense of what, what they'd left, to make sense of what they'd done. Um, my, um, uh, when I went to tell my parents that I wanted to be a writer, um, they were uh, a little baffled. Um, they had hoped, you know, I'd get a nice solid job with a utility. It was a big thing. My old man, to the, to the day I died, uh, till the day he died, my old man would, um, would call me every time Boston Gas was hiring. You have to understand, I'd published like five novels by this point. My father would call me up and he'd be like, here, this is an exam at the post office in a couple of weeks. He could never understand what it was this thing I did. Um, and that went back to when I decided to major in it. Um, I went to my parents, I dropped out of two colleges. So I was the last hope again. I went to my parents and, and my, my poor little immigrant parents just praying that their son, would, one of their kids would get a degree. And I said, uh, I think I'm going to major in creative writing because this is the only thing I'm good at, you know, which is, again, I do wish that for any parent in the world. I'm hoping for it with my own children. Um, I am a writer in a lot of ways because I suck at everything else. I have no other demonstrable talents. There is nothing. If I couldn't do this, I'd be the guy you'd be hailing down to give you a ride I, or serving you a drink. I mean, that's all I know. How to, I'm good at pool, but... I don't think that's really a skill set that you can make money at anymore in this world. So beyond that, I, that's the only demonstrable skill I had, was making stuff up. So I went to my parents and I said, I think I've dropped out of two schools, I've dropped out of two safety majors, I need to do something, pursue what I want to do. And they said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a writer. And I said, I want to get a degree in creative writing. And my mother said desperately, can you teach with that? And I didn't know any better, and I said, yes. Okay, so here's the deal. If any of you have kids who are getting bachelor's degrees in creative writing or something along those lines, art history, uh, a bachelor's degree in creative writing qualifies you for exactly one thing in this world, a master's degree in creative writing. <laughs> There's nothing else you can do with it. You, can't, you don't come out of college, hand it over to the New Yorker, and they say, we're hiring you. We want you to become a staff writer for the New Yorker. It doesn't work that way. You come out of college with a creative writing degree and you do what I did. You get a job working at a liquor store until you can save up enough money to get a fellowship to go to graduate school. That's pretty much the way it worked. But they didn't know that at the time when I told my parents. So I said, yeah, you can teach. Sure, you can teach. And my father thought about it and he said, well, you know, you're not much good at anything else. So, sure, 
go do it. And they supported me and I went off and I got a graduate degree. I mean, I got an undergrad degree and then I got a graduate degree. Um, so another reason that um, I feel that what was passed on to me in this was I grew up also in a bar culture, um, which is to say um, every Saturday, my father would take me to help him at the farmer's market in Fields Corner. And my mother could never understand why, or maybe she could and she just let it go. It would take my father, who'd grown up on a farm, two hours to pick out correct vegetables and fruits. And the truth was, it took him five minutes. He'd just throw everything at me, put it in a bag, we'd throw it in the trunk, and then we'd drive down Dot Avenue and we'd go to a bar. And that's what we would do. And to this day, I still, one of my all-time favorite smells is the first smell of spring coming through a bar door. <laughs> to this day, it really is, because I can still remember sitting in there in like a, on a perfect day in May, on a Saturday afternoon, with the Red Sox on on the TV, and they would open up the door to Dorchester Avenue. And you could, that smell of spring turning into summer, coming through the door on rubber tile that was covered in beer. <laughs> that was it. So, and what did these people do in a bar on Dorchester Avenue on a Saturday afternoon? They told stories. That's what they did. Now, here's the thing. They, this type of storytelling was not the type of storytelling we do now at a cocktail party. You've all been stuck at a cocktail party or a party at somebody's house talking to somebody who's a bad storyteller. We've all been there. And we all do the same thing. We all go, oh, no, really? And wow, and we search the crowd for somebody who we can step away to talk to. But what we don't do is be rude, most people. We just stand there and we, oh, no, no kidding. And that's, that's so. Um, that wasn't the way it worked in bars in Dorchester Avenue. If you told a bad story, you were immediately shouted down, immediately. Or they'd say, turn the Sox game back up. Or they'd say, no. Or they'd just say, oh, shut up. Or did anybody ever tell you you're not a good storyteller? I mean, it was pretty frank. So I understood very early on that there were rules to storytelling. One was get in quick. You had to start the story where the story belonged. If the story starts on a Tuesday, you start on a Tuesday. You don't start on Sunday. You don't start talking about, oh, well, I was driving past the 7-Eleven, and I went into the 7-Eleven, and I was thinking about buying a Coke, but then I started to feel like a Sprite. No, no, God, no. No, you start with, I walked into the 7-Eleven, and there was a guy standing there with a parrot on his head. That's how you start the story. So I knew, one, get in fast. Um, number two, so a story should be immediately in motion. Number two, a story um, should be funny. The reason all working class stories are funny is because most working class stories have the same point, which is, I got screwed. If you didn't get screwed, you wouldn't be working class, so you wouldn't tell the story. So that means that all stories should be ultimately true that the punchline of a working class story is usually I got screwed. And then there's some side thing, but you know, later I keyed his car, or a couple weeks later I slept with his sister. You know, like, there's something along those lines. But it's never I beat the man at his game. It can't be. There can be one exception every 10 stories. But if you tell a story where you beat the man too many times, you get shouted down because it's inauthentic. They say, no, Sully, I was there. He handed you your hat. Just shut up, that didn't happen. And then you, you then tell the real story. So that was another reason that I understood when I got into grad school, I mean, when I got into, when I started taking writing classes and I started handing in my work, that was one of the very first things people noticed. My story started. They got started because they weren't like, and then I woke up and I remember the day when I was three and my mother took me to climb my first tree. No, I didn't do that. I went right to, he got hit in the head with a frying pan, whatever it was, to start the story. Um, so, um, uh, as I went on, um, and again, I, I started to grow a little bit more successful, and I got out of graduate school, and, and then I, well, I got out of grad school. Well, here's the thing that really was a bummer for my parents. Um, I, got, I went to grad school. I finished grad school. I had my first book accepted for publication. And I said, I want to go back home. I was living in Miami at the time. And I said, I really want to go back home. I just want to go back to Boston. I want to recapture the Boston voice. I want to, because I've been away for eight years. And again, this Boston voice is extremely distinctive. So let me lay it out for you. I was in Miami. I could feel it slipping away from me. I was writing stories, and they just didn't have the same 
uh, something, something was missing. So I went back home and I ran into a friend of mine who had been kind of a brawler back in the day. And I ran into him and we were at, um, I said, how's everything going? And he said, well, it's, you know, it's good. I got stabbed, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, but otherwise, you know, I said, oh, you got stabbed. What happened? And he goes, well, I was at Sean's. Sean's was an old bar in Fayetteville Hall. He said, I was at Sean's and I was in the basement. Me and this guy just started beefing, you know, and so, you know, I hit him and he pulled out a knife and he stabbed me. And he goes, and, I, and you know, I don't know what you heard, but, you know, getting stabbed can kind of take the fight out of you. And I thought, that's it. The voice is back because I want to parse that sentence real quick here. The um, I don't know what you've heard part, the lead into the sentence. I don't know what you've heard. Like, you may be under the impression somewhere in the world that getting stabbed is kind of like a, a hot stone massage, you know? <laughs> and then the gross understatement. Not, I was praying for my God. Not, I was the worst f f feeling I ever had in my life. Not, I was the worst pain I ever knew. No, it kind of takes the fight out of a guy. And I thought, that's the Boston voice. Um, I was trying to explain this later. Um, to a friend of mine who wasn't from here. And uh, <laughs> I was with my daughter, and we were in Charlestown. I was living in Charlestown, which is God's country, in my opinion. I love Charlestown. I miss it forever. Um, I live in L.A. now. There's nothing like Charlestown in L.A., just so we're clear. So we were in there. I had my daughter. My daughter was just learning how to walk. And I was trying to explain Charlestown to somebody who didn't know it. And they said, well, I look around and all I see are BMWs and yuppies. And, you know, I said, no, 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 my friend. <laughs> you don't know a townie. Um, and you know the difference between townies and toonies? Okay, townies are people from Charlestown. Toonies are everybody else. So uh, we were at a playground. And <laughs> we walked in. I was, to, I was with my daughter. She just learned how to walk. And I walk in. <laughs> and I see this woman. And I was like, there we go. We're good. We walk in, there's this woman, and she's sitting there, and she's got the, the hair that's been bleached so many times, it's a non-color, and she's smoking a, a, a Benson & Hedges Deluxe Ultralight the size of a Scud missile, and, and she's got three kids, clearly from three different dads. And, and they're just kind of doing, this, doing their thing, and I get in a conversation with her, and she's talking to my friend, said, I didn't understand a word that she said, literally. She's like, so you're the Tonys, how you like it here? And she's talking, and literally her kids, are, one of her kids is buzzing around my daughter in a, in a plastic car, right? And she just, my daughter's still just trying to learn how to walk. She's like 13 months old, I think, at that point. And this kid just keeps going around her in this plastic car. Bzz, bzz, bzz. And the mother's talking, she's talking, and she reaches out without even looking at the kid, and she grabs the kid. And she says, hey, hey, you're scaring that little girl. You said you're scaring that little girl. You do it one more time. I swear to God, I'm taking you back to the playground and the friggin' projects. We'll see how you like it. You get shot. <laughs> My friend's like, so we're going to go. <laughs> and the woman goes, I'll never forget this. She goes, God bless. <laughs> That's the voice I try to capture. I guarantee you, you cannot tell that story about anything that happens in Davenport, Iowa. I promise you. That's a Boston story, period. Um, so, uh, and I thank, again, I thank my father for that. Um, my father, again, the guy who never read a, read, a, read a book, never read one of my books, not one. Yeah, I know. People have the exact same reaction. They go, oh. No, you know, because I, 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 I was cool with it. And then finally, I, I heard enough of those reactions. I would say to people, hey, I'm, oh, man, he didn't read. He didn't, he doesn't read my books. Never read anything. Like, he didn't even like movies. He took me to one movie my entire life. He took me to Star Wars because I bitched about it all summer. He took me to Star Wars at the Charles, the old Charles um, on Cambridge Street. And he fell asleep 10 minutes in. You know what's going on 10 minutes into Star Wars? The attack, the attack, Darth Vader shows up, you know, the attack on the Imperial starship, the whole thing. My old man went, like, nodded out. He just could not stay awake in a movie. He slept through all of my movies. He did. He slept, he slept through Mystic River. He's, he's batting it from his sleep from his eyes. I said, what'd you think? And he said, your mother said it was dark. Okay? And gone, baby, gone. You know, I see him, he's batting sleep from his eyes again. I said, what'd you think? He said, your mother said they used the F word too much. Okay? Shutter Island. Your mother didn't know what the hell to make of that one, you know. Um, so, and, so at some point, I would hear enough times, you know, oh, people would say, oh, it's sad. So finally, I said, you know, Dad, I had a sensitive moment with my dad, you know. I said, you know, you ever think you'd you know, read one of my books, you know? And he said, um, what does your brother Tommy do? I said, he works in a prison. 
And my father goes, you don't see me visiting him at work. <laughs> that was it. That was the answer. He'd tell everybody, though. My father was an amazing liar. No, no, you know, no surprise, given that that's all they did was lie uh, on storytelling nights. But my father would, I'd catch him, like, literally at parties, you know, and he'd be like, oh, that Mystic River, that was a good one. And I'd be like, you never even read it. <laughs> Go on, just talking to the person. Um, so, um, yeah, but he never, um, again, totally got it. Totally got this. He didn't read the books. He didn't, she slept through the movies. Didn't totally grasp what I did. So, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. I sold um, the movie rights to Mystic River, to Clint Eastwood. And um, I called my parents. Now, my parents at that point were retired, and they did something that if you guys retire, please don't do this to your children. If I stop you from doing this to your children, then I performed an an invaluable service right here today, which is my parents did what all people do when they moved to, to Florida to deal with their kids. They buy two phones. They put one phone in one room, the other phone in the other room. And then when your kids call, they answer both of them pick up a phone, right? So the idea is that this is going to facilitate communication, but it doesn't because it turns into a game of that Dixie Cup game where we used to talk to each other and like, can you hear me? Can you hear me? They get obsessed with what the other one is doing on the phone call. So you call in, and you say, hi, Mom, and hi, Dennis, how are you? And then all of a sudden, my father would pop in. And they'd be like, and they'd obsess with what room you're in. Where, where are you? Oh, I'm in the living room. Where are you? I'm in the kitchen. You're in the kitchen? Yeah, I'm in the kitchen. And then they lose you. You're done. You're out of the conversation. They're like, why are you in the kitchen? Because I'm in the kitchen, because I like the kitchen phone. Oh, I like the living room phone. Well, obviously, you're in the living room. And, and then they say, well, who's on the phone? By that point, they forgot about you. Who's on the phone? Oh, it's Dennis. Oh, it's Dennis. Oh, okay. How are you, Dennis? And then they go back. Okay, so I call them when I agree to sell the movie rights to Clint Eastwood. Right. All right. I call them up, and I say to my parents, uh, I just sold the movie rights to my book to Clint Eastwood. And my mother says, oh my, in a tone of voice that made me realize something that I never wanted to know, which was that my mother was attracted to Clint Eastwood. <laughs> which I really never needed to know that. Uh, but then my father comes in and he saves the day by saying, who's Clint Eastwood? And my mother says, and then they lose me. My mother says, you know who he is, Mike? And he says, I don't. And she says, he was in Westerns. And my father says, was he on Bonanza? Because that was the last TV show my father ever watched. And she says, I don't think so. So my father says, then I have no, no idea who the hell he is, right? So, uh, so we go forward, and they make the movie. And uh, my, uh, uh, I'm out with Clint one night, and... Uh, he says to me, um, you never asked for anything. You never asked for anything. And I was like, yeah, why, why would I? You know, like I had this whole thing, like I was just going to never, ever, because I had this friend, I had this friend, they made a movie of his, of, his, of his book. And he went, they allowed him on the set one day. And he went up and he went up to this actor, this very famous actor who was in his book. And he said, hi, I'm the guy who wrote the book. And the guy said, the actor turned to him and he said, what makes you think I'd give a shit? And I heard that story, and my friend told me that story, and I said, I would be arrested. I would, because I'd end up assaulting the actor, and then I'd be arrested. You know, I just, I knew. So I said, I'm not going to treat Hollywood, I'm not going to make Hollywood think I want them. I don't care. Welcome, make a movie. I hope it turns out well. And that made them want to be with me. It was really bizarre. So, so Sean Penn and I spent a lot of time together, too much, to the point where they had to separate us after a while. Uh, <laughs> we got along great. And, and then Clint and I spent a lot of time together, um, uh, including one really surreal night where we were uh, out near the Bell and Hand. Anybody know where the Bell and Hand Tavern is? There's a tavern right beside it, and it was a jazz quintet playing in the window with the window open. It was a September night. And we went and we stood and we watched them. And then they finished and we clapped. And they turned around and nodded their thanks. And then they turned back. And then they freaked out because it was Clint Eastwood standing behind doing this. But he was already walking away. And they, to this day, I bet that band is telling people, we saw Clint Eastwood. And they were like, why would you see Clint Eastwood? What would Clint Eastwood be doing in Boston? What are you talking about? So, um, yes. So Clint and I were hanging out one night. And he said, um, 
you know, you never ask for anything. We're starting to think you're CIA. You know, you, know, you, you, you come by only when we like really beg you to come by and you never buy the set. And I'm like, I don't really want to go by the set. Set's the most boring place in the world. Sets are really boring places, just so you know. And they're extreme. A novelist who wants to be on a set, I don't get it. You, you've already done your job. So you are far less important than the caterer, way less important. So I don't get writers who are like, they never invited me to the set. Well, why would they? What are you going to do? Sit around and like look at somebody, you know, do the Chris Farley moment, you know, or you're like talking to somebody and like, oh, I met so-and-so. It's pointless for an author to be on the set. So I was trying to avoid being on the set, but Clint wanted me on the set, so I kept showing up on the set. But it kind of took me out of the movie. Like to this day, when I see certain scenes from the movie, I know where I was. So I don't feel, I don't never feel like I'm locked in that movie because I'm always just like, yeah, I was sitting right over there. I was on the floor there. But anyway, so Clint says to me, what would you like? Do, ask something of me. And I said, well, I think my parents would like to come to the set. So he said, oh, okay. So I bring them by tomorrow. So I did. I brought my parents to the set. And, um, you know, Clint Eastwood and I couldn't be, couldn't be more different politically. We couldn't be. And yet, um, who cares? Like, we are just completely, as human beings, who cares about politics? And he is the greatest gentleman I've ever worked with in any capacity, in any business, without a doubt. And I would walk out of a room if somebody ever said anything bad about him. And we, because of moments like this, we show up on the set, they've got director's chairs waiting for my parents with their names on them, right? And somebody comes over, and I think, I always think this is because Clint's mother is Scottish. He knew to do this. They bring them tea, not coffee. They're Irish, they brought them tea. So they sat there with their tea, and they watched him direct a scene with Sean Penn and Laura Linney, and then he came out, and then he met them. And he shakes my mother's hand, and my mother gets a look on her face like she's never gonna wash that hand again. She's just staring at the hand. She's just baffled. She's just completely overwhelmed. And I turn, and my father's talking to Clint. I told him my father was a charming bastard. And he was incredibly charming. And he's talking to Clint, and I can see Clint is like actually bowing up. And I listen to what he's saying. And he's telling him how much he loves his films <laughs> and, 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 and how much they've meant to him and his sons over the years and how they brought them together. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I can't stop the guy. And he's just going and going and going. And so I finally said, you know, Clint finally leaves. My mother's still in a stupor. And... Um, I finally turned, and I turned to my father, and I said, um, do you have no idea who he is, do you? And he goes, no, no, no. <laughs> Seemed like a nice man. <laughs> and I said, Dad, you just lied to Clint Eastwood. And he said, well, it wasn't a lie exactly. I said, what are you talking about? You told him that you saw all his films and that, and that it, they helped us bond. And, and he said, well, did you like his films? I said, yes. He said, did your brothers like his films? I said, yes, we all liked his films. He goes, did you watch his films? Said, yes. On weekends? Yes. And you didn't bother me? And I said, no. And he goes, then we bonded. <laughs> so we then turn around, and there's a um, backdrop. And now you guys. I know everybody knows what a backdrop is, but trust me, until you've actually been around one, you really don't. It's hard to describe. So like when you're watching TV tomorrow night or the next night, and you see a scene in which the major characters are sitting around in an office building, it's a Dick Wolf scene. Somebody's sitting around in an office building, they're all talking about whatever they're talking about. And outside, you see Boston, or you see New York, or you see whatever. Trust me, it's not there. It's really not there. That's a backdrop on a set. That's all it is. It's a big, tall photograph. And it's right rolled outside a window on a set, and they're just sitting in a set, and it looks like it's nighttime. That's it. Um, and I guarantee it, it looks super realistic. You're going to sit there, and you're going to be like, no, they're really there. They're not. They're not. They're on a set. And so there was this set. I mean, there was this backdrop. And it was the backdrop of Constitution Wharf. It was a backdrop of the waterfront in Boston. And my father walks up to it, and he's just staring at it. And, and I finally wander over to him, and I say, what? What's the big deal? And he says, that's where I came in. Right there. That's where we came in. 1949. 
That's where I came in, on the boat. That's the wharf I came in through. I said, oh, my God. And he says, none of this is real. I said, nope, it's all fake. It's fake. And he was like, wow. And he says, do you ever think of going back to teaching? <laughs> That's a true story. That's a true story. Um, so um, I will say then, uh, I'll leave you with one final thing, the, the more serious moment. My father has asked me for two things in my entire life. He has never asked me for anything else. He never asked me. I bought him a car, and he was psyched about that. He thought that was pretty cool. Um, but he didn't ask for it. Never asked for anything. He asked for two things. I want you to think about this for the rest of your life so you know what this means. With great hesitation, almost even shaking, he asked for my diplomas. He asked for my bachelor's degree and my master's degree. And they hung up in his wall for the rest of his life. That's what you guys are doing. I wish you the greatest journey for it. Um, congratulations, you know, and I will take some questions. So, cheers. Don't be shy. Somebody's going to be first. This young lady over here. Uh, do you still have family in Dorchester? Do I still have family in Dorchester? Um, no, I got a lot of friends, but my family pulled out. Um, uh, they, let's see, they left, they left in the early 90s, um, almost everybody. It was a big dig thing, but also everybody just goes to Quincy or Braintree. <laughs> Braintree's just Dorchester South. I mean, it's just, let's just call a spade a spade. That's all it is. Um, so, yeah, no, they, they, they left Dorchester. I'm trying to think. I had the most wonderful, I will say, I, I did have the most wonderful experience this summer. Um, I drove by there with my girlfriend and my daughters, and I drove by the house I grew up in, and there was a moving truck out front, and I hadn't been in it in 25 years, and they had just sold it. And I walked in with my daughters, and the tenant was like, yeah, you, you, you're, you're him? And I was like, yeah, I'm him. And he was like, knock yourself out. <laughs> and they were pulling out the last of it, and I got to walk my daughters, who were seven and 10, around my house, and they just kept jumping up and down, going, we're in daddy's footsteps, well, daddy was here, daddy slept here, and that, they, I never went able to give that to them in, in my life. Um, but yeah, that was the last time I was in Dorchester, and no, everybody's gone, they're all in Braintree. And I never see them because, I'm sorry, if you move South Shore, you lose me as a friend, I'm sorry, it's just, just the, the commute just sucks, man. I mean, I'm sorry, I gotta deal with it now, I gotta get down there today, and I'm just kinda like, oh man, really? Like, it's been like six years, and I'm still like, oh, really, I gotta go to South Shore? So, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, yeah, it's a bear of a commute. So, yes, sir, I can repeat, I'll hear it, yep. Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, you said that you don't like going to sets for, of movies of your books. Yeah. Um, aren't you, like, in agony or concern sometimes that the character being portrayed in a movie might be very different from what you had in mind? In the book? Oh, sure. Oh, so, no, but I'm not worried about that. Of course the character's going to be different than what I had in mind. I, want you to, I, wa I do want you to understand that. So, uh, so Mystic River, which is my most um, probably heartfelt book, the, the one I poured the most of myself into, um, the movie is one I cannot judge. I can't judge it. I, I trust it's good. I can judge its parts. Because it's just not... It, that's not my Jimmy Marcus. That's Sean Penn's Jimmy Marcus. That's not my Dave Boyle. That's not the Dave Boyle I had in my head. That's Tim Robbins' Dave Boyle. And they, they do great, they do great work. Casey Affleck played my most, um, not popular character, but certainly the character I've written the most of. I've written you know, six books with Patrick Kenzie in it. That's not what I thought of when I created Patrick Kenzie, but I love Casey's performance. It's great. So you just gotta kinda get to where you split it. It's kinda schizophrenic. But what you care about is not whether they get the, the, the granular details of something right. You want them to get the spirit of the book. Is the spirit of the book there? So I'll give you the perfect example, and cinema is very different than books too. Gone Baby Gone has a very literary ending. It's extremely literary. The main character goes and he sits in the Ryan playground and he thinks. And that's the last six pages of the book. It's just him thinking about everything he did wrong. He just... Scoot it all up. 
Ben Affleck, in shooting Gone Baby Gone, can't have a character sit thinking to end a movie. So he came up with an image, this beautiful image of the guy sitting on a couch with a little girl and the camera panning behind a widescreen TV in a crappy apartment, which says so much about the inability to, for deferred gratification, right? The image is completely different than the image in the book. It's just as good. It's cinema versus literature. And there's just a difference. As long as they don't embarrass you, you, you know, that's not, what you fear is the Scarlet Letter that they made in the 90s with Demi Moore. I mean, I mean, the only thing missing from that movie was a car chase. I mean, you, know, you just, you fear the ones that totally get the essence of it wrong. But as long as they're respectful of the material, it's a very hard job. I can't stand, I cannot stand writers who go on TV or give interviews dissing the people who made films of their work, unless the films are so disrespectful. But I remember when Anne Rice was running to every microphone she could talking about Tom Cruise being wrong to play Lestat, the vampire. And I'm like, it's a vampire. He's not Hamlet. He's not even Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. He's a vampire <laughs> who plays rock and roll in one book, if I remember right. I mean, get over it. And I just found it so disingenuous. And it's like, it's like the line about the guy who leaves the bordello complaining that doesn't feel loved. I mean, <laughs> shut up. You took the money, you know? Like, just shut up. Take the money. Cash the check. And so if I ever have a film that is an embarrassment of one of my books, the only way you'll know is you won't hear from me. I'll just vanish. Jimmy Hoffa will be easier to find than me. I'll just vanish and I won't give interviews and I won't do anything, I'll just vanish. But that seems to me respectful because 150 to 200 people work on a film and they put their heart and their soul into it usually. And if it doesn't turn out, look, Live By Night did not turn out well as a film. But that doesn't mean, that's, that has nothing to do with its value. It just didn't ultimately all come together and nobody wanted to see it. So that doesn't, that's not a reflection though on the effort that everybody put into it. And I was honored that they made that film and I was honored that the effort that they put into it. So no, I just hope with, you go, I go into business with people I trust and people whose work I respect and then I just hope for the best. And so far it's worked out. So yes, sir. If you had one book of mine to read, I don't know, ask everybody else. No, I don't know. Um, I would say Mystic River, personally, um, or The Given Day. Those are my, I, I personally think my two best books, but, um, but you never trust the writer. No, because we don't. It's like asking me to judge my kids. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, it's tough. But I do feel like The Given Day, The Given Day is funny because The Given Day is 700 pages long. And so it, I get two reactions to The Given Day, <laughs> literally. I've only gotten two, and they're both, one's really flattering. I hear it's one of the best books I've ever written. I've, I've ever read. Thank you. Or I hear, well, I started it. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see here. I'm just trying to go. Uh, sir, in the left. Just, I, Coming from Dorchester. I'm from Dorchester as well. Nice. Oh, are people in my books reflective of people I know? Um, no. To be honest, no. I, I, it is, but here's the thing. I'll give you the one story. I'll give you one story, and it's real easy. And I teach students to not do this, too. Don't write from real life, because here's what happens. You get hung up remembering what really happened or what the person really did, not what should happen or what they should do. And it, and it becomes a mess. So, and if you're doing it for revenge... This is why I tell the story. I wrote one character based on one person. That is true. One character is completely based on one person, and it's one of the most reprehensible characters I ever created. And I was grinding an ax, and I was putting everything I remembered about this person into this, into this character, everything. And I was at a signing, and I look up, and there she is. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, dear God. Can I get to secure, but I just got to ride it out. I got to ride it out. I got to ride it out. All of a sudden, she's standing in front of me, smelling like a pack of menthols and, and a Kahlua. And she says, little Denny Lehane, 
You grow up in everything. I got to ask you one question. Sure. She goes, the mother in Gone Baby Gone. I'm like, here we go. Here we go. Where'd you come up with that bitch? <laughs> there you go. There goes revenge. There goes everything. She didn't even get it. Um, so I, I, and I, and it was very different. The character I took, the story itself is not the story that you know, but it is, Gone Baby Gone was very, was inspired by one of the worst things in my, that ever happened to me that I, that I knew of, but it was not the story that you see on the page because I just broke, I broke bad from it. I just said, okay, I know where, I know where my germ is and now I'm going to break away. But that character was her and it didn't mean no good. Never got it. So I'll go, so, ma'am, yes. She just said the given day is her all-time favorite. She's a wonderful person. I just want to say and very, very smart, whatever she's going to ask. Oh, yeah, well, the inspiration for The Given Day, because The Given Day is a big, fat, historical novel, and nothing I'd never written anything like it before. Um, the, the inspiration for it was a couple of things. One was the boss. I'd heard about the Boston police strike. When Reagan fired the air traffic controllers in 1984, he invoked the, the um, Boston police strike, where Calvin Coolidge famously said, no one has the right to strike against the public trust anytime, anywhere. Right? So that was Calvin Coolidge's line to break the Boston police strike as governor of, the, of Massachusetts, right? So I said at the time, I said, the Boston police went on strike to my father, and he said, oh, yeah. I said, when? He was like, I don't know, 1942 or something. You know, it was 1919. But um, <laughs> so, so, um, uh, so it was always in the back of my recesses of my mind, the Boston police went on strike. What was that? What happened, you know? And then I just idly came across a book in a bookstore in New York City called A City in Terror, which was about the Boston police strike. And I picked it up, and I flipped to a page, and it, and it was about the cavalry charge down Beacon Hill. That in the riots that broke out after the Boston police walked off the job, the Boston police walked off the job, and there was no police force in this entire city from September 10th until Jan 1919 until January 20th, 1920. We had no police. We were under martial law, right? So they sent the 7th Cavalry down Beacon Hill to break up a riot in Scully Square. And I said, that is the coolest thing I have ever heard, right? That they was literally cobble. I could see the cobblestone, and I could see horse hooves on co And I said, that's so awesome. And then I did a little bit more research, and I discovered that <laughs> the Brahmins were freaked out that the natives were, were, were clearly had grown restless and were uprising, right? So the Brahmins, had, and the biggest trouble was in South Boston. So the Brahmins came up with the novel idea that to protect themselves against the great unwashed and poor people, um, they should arm the Harvard football team. <laughs> and that's what they did. They armed the Harvard football team, they sent them to the Broadway Bridge, and they fired on a crowd, and they killed three people. And I went, for somebody with my class rage issues, I was like, I'm in. I didn't know it was going to take me five years of my life to write the book, but it did. It just sprawled. It just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and becoming a book about this one year in American history, which I found endlessly fascinating. I mean, I just couldn't believe. I, I've never come across a more exciting and terrifying year in American history than 1919 to 19, 19, late 1918 after World War I ended to 1920. We had the great influenza outbreak. We had the molasses flood. We had, uh, at a national level, the night of the 32 bombs, in which 32 bombs were discovered in the postal annex to go out to 32 members of Congress, judges, um, and captains of industry. And they were discovered by accident. And then we had the Red Scare. We had the Palmer Raids. We had uh, a summer of race massacres in uh, 1919. Um, and then we had the, it all culminated in the Boston police strike. And I just thought, I'm writing this. And, and then five years later, I produced it, and people said they started it. <laughs> that was it. Five years of my life, I started it. Thanks. Did you buy it? Yes, that's all I care about. Uh, <laughs>
<laughs> yes, ma'am, the back. How was my voice on the wire? Um, I feel like, and I've, I've, I feel like this to this day. Um, what, the, what they realized with the wire was they, they came up with the idea to get urban, great urban writers. They didn't care about our TV experience, nothing. We were schooled on that show. So it was mostly novelists. It was me, George Pelicanos. They brought in Richard Price, who was an idol of mine. Um, and uh, what they said was, you do you and we'll fill in the Baltimore details. So if you saw my wire scripts, they would say things like, you know, McNulty would say, I'm heading down to, and then there would be a parenthesis. I don't know where the hell he was going, you know? And then they just fill it in. You know, just, oh, the, the Western, okay. Um, so no, uh, I feel like, I always feel um, that my running joke is this about me, is how urban I basically am. Um, you could drop me probably into Mogadishu, and I could find my way out. I could figure it out. I understand cities. I get them. I wouldn't be terrified. I'd be scared. I'd be very scared if it was Mogadishu, but I'd probably figure it out. Um, if you dropped me 40 yards into the Blue Hills, anywhere off a road where I was looking at trees, I would die. I would just die. It would, I'd, I'd just die. I would die of starvation in Milton, you know, uh, because I'm no good in nature. I have no grasp of nature. I don't, I just sort of look at it and I appreciate it and I go, nice tree and I move on. <laughs> Closest I want to get to nature is like a cafe on Newbury Street outdoors with a Cinzano umbrella. That's, I'm good. I'm outdoors. Um, so I understand cities. That's my thing. That's my obsession. And so it was easy to plug us into the wire. You know, it really was. Um, I can write about New York. I could write about Philly. I could write about, I think I could pick it up really fast. But everything else, anything non-urban, I, I feel like a tourist. You know, so, yeah. Sir? Uh, yes, you, you, sir. Yes. I do. I do. So just so you know, from the outside in, okay, from the outside, I haven't lived in Boston since 2013. I was shocked. I went to California, I thought, for a year, and I got stuck there. So uh, um, I read the boss, I read Boston.com every day, every day. And I read the Globe online. And it's amazing to me. It's like, wait a minute, Doyle's? Doyle's is closing? Um, uh, every time I turn around, it seems now that they're going to take out the barn, they, they're going to wipe out Davis Square, I, as I understand it. Is that true? That they've they got this massive development going on in Davis Square, they're going to just knock out all the, knocking out Sligo's and all these great bars and all these great little pizza places. So do I think it's changing? Yeah, do I think it's changing for the better? Doesn't seem to be, but, but I don't, I'm, I'm, from, I'm from the outside looking. It's easy for me to go, oh, you know, woe is me for a city I don't live in. But it does seem like this isn't, I don't know, if, if there's no accent in 30 years, I'm going to be really sad. You know what I mean? Like if nobody's saying, you know, oh, that's piss a kid, I'm going to be sad. I'm going to be like, you know, that's the language I understand. But there's sir, all the way, I, I'm sorry, I can't tell. There's somebody all the way in the back. Oh, ma'am, all the way in the back. As an undergrad, did you know I always wanted to write? I always wrote. But where I came from, in Dorchester, when I was growing up there, nobody became a writer. You know, it did, you didn't. This was the only famous person who had come out of Dorchester at that point was Donna Summer. And we fought with Roxbury over her. You know, it was kind of like, no, she's mine, no, she's mine, no, she's mine. Because it was right on the line, right? So um, nobody, this was pre-Wahlberg. There was no Wahlbergs out of Dorchester. So people didn't go into entertainment from Dorchester. It didn't happen. So I... I, I that's why I took the first two safety ma majors. My first major was print journalism. And then I realized something that was important then. I don't think it would keep you from getting a job now. But then it was I didn't like facts. And I just kept thinking I could, I could come up with a better line there. You know, so. Uh, and then I went to, to then I, my next safety major was English Lit. So I could teach literature. And, and then I realized something that was terrible for an English teacher, and it still affects me when I teach. I don't like talking about books. 
I love reading them, but my students could tell you, you know, I'd be like, you have to read this book. They'd say, why? I'd say, because you do. They'd say, help us a little bit more, professor. No, why should I help you? Just read the book. Let it flow over you, you know? So I'm not good at explicating books. I'm not good at any of that. So then I realized, well, I've been writing since I was eight years old. It's how I make sense of the world. I can't stop, which is the biggest sign. The biggest sign that you're a writer is you can't stop. You just can't do it. You, just can't, you cannot put the pen down at some, at some degree. So then I just said, all right, I'm just going to do it. And when I decided to do it, the other great thing in coming from Dorchester was I said, there is no way I'm going back. Everybody who ever took a class with me was my roommate, knew me in college or graduate school. They say the exact same thing. I had laser focus. My, all I was going to do, I was going to be a writer if it killed me, no matter what. Because what I wasn't going to do was end up back at the Banshee on Dot Ave, having all my old friends going, you know, bartending, having all my old friends be like, hey, Steinbeck, bring me another bud. That wasn't happening. <laughs> so it was a no looking back proposition. And I think that helped. I think no safety net sometimes can be the best um, sort of uh, uh, it, the guarantee that you're going to stick to your ambition if you've got no place to fall. And there was no place for me to fall. It was write or publish or die, <laughs> you know, really. So I hope that helps. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, this is final question. Sure. Yes, when I write novels, which I haven't done in a couple of years, sorry, uh, when I write novels, I have to set a, a, a goal. And what I usually do is I, I say that I have to, I don't care about word count. I don't care about pages. It's time. And I, I feel, for me, everybody's different, but for me, I have to put in a minimum of two to three hours every morning. Um, after three hours, everything that comes out is crap. It's true. It's really hard to write past three hours, the three-hour point. Everything, you're just going to rewrite it again tomorrow. Um, but unless you hit a real groove, and then, yeah, then it's fine. But the, otherwise, um, I think you have to do it every day. It's a muscle, and it atrophies if you don't do it. Now, I am writing nonstop right now because I work on several different TV shows, and I'm behind the scenes on several other TV shows, and I've been getting a lot of movie work, and it's great for me because... And I'll tell you why. I got little kids, and when I write a novel, I need complete immersion into the novel. I can't, I can't have a slightest interruption. It's really hard for me. It's, writing is extremely hard for me, no, novel writing. Um, so with little kids, I can't. I can't get up, drive my kids to school, come back and work on a novel. The novel's gone. It's out of my head. It's done. My work is done for the day. I can't do it. But with a script, for some reason... I think it's because I have a lot of trouble describing. That's, that's work to me. Describing this room would be the hardest thing for me to do. The hardest scene I always say that I ever wrote in Live By Night was the scene where he goes into the opening of the uh, Statler Hotel, which is now the Boston Park Plaza. And he walks in the grand opening of that hotel in 1927. And it's just him walking through that party, right? And that took me a week to write. Because you've got to keep the action going. You've got to keep the guy moving. But you want to sink the audience, into the reader, into feeling that they're in 1927 at the gala opening of a hotel. And this is what's going on. And this is what the music sounds like. And here's who, what people are dressed like. But you can't stop the action. That's really, really hard for me. It's just other writers, it's easy for them. But it's super hard for me. Um, you know how that scene would look in a script? Interior. Hotel. Night. That's it. Done. It's a second of my life. So scripts right now are where I'm at because I can drive my kids to school. I can, I can talk through their emotional problems. I can get them in. I can turn around. I can drive back. I can have breakfast. And at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, I can write a script. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I could write a script on the 50-yard line of Gillette. I can just write a script. I just scripts. It's just interior, exterior, day. And then you have people talking. I'm good at people talking. That's what I do. So... Yeah, I, but if you're going to be a novelist or a prose writer of any point, you have to put in the minimum, bare minimum, 
one hour a day. And I'm going to end you on, I'll, I'll literally leave you with the last anecdote that I know that will speak to this. Toni Morrison, when she wrote her first novel, Bluest Eye, which is brilliant, was an editor at Random House, one of the editors-in-chief at Random House. That is a job that is about a 12 to 16 hour a day job. You don't just, she had a young kid, and she figured out the only time she could write, get that solid one hour, that's all you need, but you need it, was between four and five in the morning. So The Bluest Eye was written between four and five in the morning over the course of a year and a half while she did everything else in her life. That one hour, though, if you can commit to that one hour, is all you ultimately need. But you need that hour. And if you don't do it, it's amazing what happens. Well, nothing. <laughs> so thank you all so much. I got to go. Thank you. You're a wonderful audience. Thanks. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. And I'm sure that we'll all be thinking of Dennis the next time we watch The Departed. So enjoy. <laughs>